Hello, everybody, and welcome to Be My Guest. And my very special guest today is Niall O'Leary, a, a, a colleague of mine in Irish dancing. I seem to be interviewing quite a few Irish dancers. Uh, yeah. And um, Niall, you're living in New York now, um, but you're originally from Almerian in, uh, in, in Dublin. Tell me about, what it, firstly, how you got involved in Irish dancing, Niall. Great, Mary. Well, uh, hi to all your viewers and great to be on. And, um, you know, I started doing the dancing. Um, we were basically, um, I suppose we were watching the television one night and we saw uh, Kevin Massey on the television. And my mother called up RTE to find out who this guy was. And so myself and my sister Aideen were uh, brought down to Irish dancing classes then the following week with Kevin Massey. <laughs> and yeah, so we didn't realise at the time that he was the same guy who had trained Michael Flatley when he won his world championship in the 1970s. Well, I actually didn't know that. Yeah. I thought Michael Flatley was with... Um, with well, Michael um, Flatley was announced as, and in first place, uh, world champion Michael Flatley from the Dennis Dennehy School in Chicago. Yeah. He'd been actually living in Ireland, it turns out. He'd been living in Dublin for a year, and uh, he'd been training and studying with Kevin Massey in Dunleary in Dublin, um, where, we, where we went for the classes. And so... Um, Michael Flatley explains in his autobiography that Kevin Massey was his coach, his motivator, his kick up the backside, his arm around the shoulder. That basically, um, Kevin Massey I knew was, it was the guy Dennis. I knew it was Dennis was announced because I would have been in at the World Championships the same um, yeah. every year that Michael Flatley would have been uh, there, but he was right, older, yeah. he was in the older age groups. But yeah. Well, um, Dennis and Marge Dennehy would have um, trained him in, in yeah, how to dance yeah. in the first place. But, but apparently Kevin Massey was over on the Cultus North American tour, I think was it 1972 and 1974. And um, I did a couple of tours myself at the Cultus and they basically say to you, tonight you're staying in so-and-so's house. And Kevin Massey was, was told, tonight you're staying in the Flatley's house. And so he stayed in Michael Flatley's house and must have shown him a few moves. And then I think Michael Flatley went back and forth and then he moved to Ireland for a year. And apparently... He said at the time um, that he believed that he, he would never win the World Irish Dancing Championships living in the United States of America, which, um, and he was the first American to win the Worlds, but there have been many world champions since um, in both sides. Many. Gosh, the, standards, the, standard, the, the standard state side is just as it is everywhere now. I mean, you, 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 you know, the UK, America, um, even the emerging countries, like you can see some beautiful dancers coming out of Israel. Yeah, there's some great dancing everywhere. And um, back in the 1970s, when the World Championship started, um, the, wor the best dancers in the world were undoubtedly from Ireland, England well, and Scotland. They would have and been because they were the first and, you know, it, it was our tradition. But the but oldest I've, award you know, was won by people in Canada and Australia and New Zealand. Hardly everyone... And like they gave this overseas award, which they still do, to people from emerging regions. But at the time, the um, United States were eligible for it, but people rarely won it. And there was the odd win, and uh, Michael Flatley won. And then um, there was another guy that won in the 1970s, um, Stephen Gallagher. Yeah, and I remember Stephen Gallagher. School. Yeah. And um, he was the first American to win the World Championships, living in America, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, the point is, there have been loads of winners since, you know, and... Um, Oh, gosh, I, you couldn't count how many. Quick, quick, yeah. Yeah, you couldn't count how many have won it yeah. since. It's just, I mean, uh, yeah, it's the standard. But, you know, it's, it's, um, it's hard work as well, I mean, to have got, to have jumped that quickly, really, in, a, in you know, what, in 40 years, uh, yeah. less than 40 years, to have jumped that much of a, a, of a divide. Yeah, I think that um, there's been obviously people moving to the United States to teach and there's been a lot of people workshopping. And I think it's just people taking the dancing more seriously and people training really hard for it. And, you know, people nowadays who are looking to win the World Championships, they're dancing uh, for a couple of hours every day of the week, literally. And, um, you know, you've got, not alone do you have um, an Irish dancing teacher, you've got like Fitness physio, 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 I was just going to say, physio, and, physio and all these people on board. Like it's, it's like if you're training for the Olympics, you've got a team around you. And um, I saw that there was a controversy now recently in the last couple of weeks about um, the tennis, that professional tennis players were told you can only bring one person into the, the stadium. And they're like, no, I have to bring my whole team, my masseur, 
and my motivation coach, they all have to come with me. And the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, I think it's good. I think it's good because when we competed uh, in the 70s and that, um, oh God, I suppose I danced up seven nights a week up to the age of 32 um, in, uh, between shows and that. And yeah. um, you never did exercises. You never did warm-ups. You never did cool-downs or whatever. You, that and, came in after your time, Mary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but you didn't, and and, and you ended up with um, with repetitive strain injuries, or you ended up with with problems with your toes, or problems with your your knees. I don't have problems with my knees, thank God, yet. But um, but people did because they didn't. They just went up on stage and they danced. There was no such thing as doing. Yeah, well, and I that, think nowadays I think people are bouncing around the stage so much more, and they're travelling with such speed across the floor. Yeah. But one of the major things as well is that now at every fesh in North America every stage must be a sprung dance floor. You can no longer have a fesh on a solid floor. And there's the odd one every so often that gets... Can I just apologise, Niall, before we go any further yeah. for this mug? Uh, in case anyone sees it, one of, my, one of the broadcasters here, my co-broadcaster, I just want to apologise and disassociate myself from the mug. <laughs> OK, great. It's, a, it's in, 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 in honour of your president. We won't comment on that any further. This is not a political programme. Thank you. No. <laughs> I just realised when I saw it in the camera. I I've thought, got a oh, nice oh, um, Celtic is, design on my mug. This is Pat's mug and I'm drinking out of it. So this is not mine. It's not your mug. As long as we've made that clear. I'm not making mug, any not political statements. I just realised what mug he gave me to drink tea in. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyhow. Um carry on you were you you but anyway yeah i actually um i brought an emotion um at the north american irish dancing teachers uh, convention one year that every stage at a fesh must have a sprung floor and the motion passed and so um that has Great enabled idea. people to i suppose you yeah. know to do their best and and i suppose lessen the chances of injury and as a result of that i think most dance studios now have a sprung floor as well and i've definitely taught workshops over the years for eight hours on a saturday on a, a wooden floor that was like over concrete with no spring on it and you're definitely your body would hurt after it you know and so i think that people are a lot more aware nowadays of uh, the risk of injury and yeah. the precautions that are necessary in order to optimize performance so it's yeah, definitely well, i mean even in bonratti we danced on flagstone floors yeah and cracks on the floors and wooden um wooden um makeshift stages with gaps and i remembered one time dancing in napo castle with uh Jer stack and there was a glass floor d underneath us it was yeah. a perspex type glass floor it was glass with a light under it to shine up and show our costumes and that and he spun me around on it and i went through the glass floor <laughs> up as far as my no. and I, whipped my leg out so quickly i only had a slight little nick but you could hear the audible gasps inside in the room from the french wow. they were a french audience but it was shock that made me jump out so quickly wow. but pure luck that i wasn't ripped asunder but you wouldn't you wouldn't have that now so it was a groundbreaking performance it was a groundbreaking i smashed the glass well i smashed the glass floor <laughs> and not the ceiling <laughs> wow amazing yeah, it was funny. The things you do for Ireland. The things you do for dancing as well. <laughs> Getting up at five o'clock in the morning um, to, to perform for a German audience. Nobody yeah. else, only Germans, would be up at that hour of the morning for breakfast. Indeed. You know, it's just, but it was just, yeah. We're addicted, aren't we, now? I think so. In a good way. In a good way. It's a healthy addiction. Exactly. You know, but you, um, you carried on anyway with Massey School. Yeah, so I was actually Kevin Massey's last All-Ireland champion and um, when I was 10 and a half. And then he quit teaching a year later. And so, um, yeah, I ended up after a number of years then in the Rory O'Connor School. And it was Rory Isn't he gorgeous? and Brother, Anne and Breitha that trained me then after that. Yeah, so it was great he, and I had a great time. He, uh, Rory O'Connor was a beautiful dancer. He used to dance on TV. He used to dance on radio. That's right, yeah. There was um he was, he, he was before no Michael Flatley dancing yeah. on radio. 
there was a show, Dinjo, Take the Floor, and Rory O'Connor was on it regularly, but I don't yeah. think there's any recordings on it. Sunday evenings, half seven, my producer is telling me there, the, the producer who presented me with the... <laughs> Can you stop showing the mug, please, Mary? Thank you. <laughs> if the mug is right. <laughs> no more of whatever you're drinking. I, you never said what's in it. We won't ask that either. Tea. Oh, tea. Oh, it's lovely. Addicted to tea. Of course it's tea, yeah. So, yeah, I was sitting in the Bramer Rooms backstage in Churchtown County, Dublin, one time before a show, and Rory O'Connor was sitting beside me. And he turned to me and he said, I wonder when will Robert Emmett's epitaph ever be written? And I was there, I was thinking of my steps. And here was Rory on a different plane. And I was thinking, wow, this guy's amazing, you know? Yeah, but well, I mean, on that matter, I don't think it'll ever be written because we... You know, um, we we wrote our we we signed, sealed, and delivered ourselves over to Europe. Yeah. There's no autonomy there. We just changed colonizer. Ooh, that's one way to put it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just changed colonizer, um, and uh, yeah. So we just, we're like a country that wasn't able to cope with with independence. So we just kind of said, okay, you handle us. You tell us what to do. Yeah. You know, but um, so you went, you moved to America. Yeah, I moved to New York City in the mid 1990s and um, I went there working full time as an architect, which I trained in University College Dublin. And I also was teaching dancing and performing quite a bit. And the word got out that I was in town and I got asked to teach some private classes. And my first student was actually Dara Carr, who I've been performing with um, mm -hmm. for many years since. She has her own dance company now, Dara Carr yeah. Dance as well. And she performs with my dance troupe regularly. And so um, I was teaching and performing and working as an architect. And I started playing a little music at the fashion as well. I'd, I'd been playing the accordion since the age of seven. And, um, and then obviously in more recent years, I started adjudicating. So, and I've been teaching workshops around the United States and Canada, and now I teach in Mexico as well. And so- um, Wow. Involved really, but <laughs> no, I, I was never it. in Mexico. It's, why it's a country that, yeah, it's, uh, it's... Oh, it's fascinating. And you know, there are about six or seven Irish dancing schools there and all the dancers are really getting good together, I would say. And there hasn't been, um, in the girls now in Mexico, there hasn't been, let's say, a top podium, top three, let's say, yet for Mexico. But I feel there will be in the next 10 years because they're all getting good together. There's been some guys who have done very well in the worlds now for Mexico, but um, there's loads of... It would be fabulous to Mexican have a Mexican champion. Good. Yeah, oh, I can I, see. You know, it's happening. lovely to see these emerging countries. Yeah. You know, John Kerry is out in Israel. He's out in Russia, mm -hmm. isn't he? I believe so, yeah. No, and, like um, yeah, with, with Daria. Daria. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think that's all wonderful that, the, that these countries, China. Yeah. Oh, China. I mean, the, I, and I, Japan I, you as know. well. Um, there's like places where you wouldn't associate with Irish culture. And one of the great things about it is that, yeah, there's been Irish people visiting like myself, but the people um, there in Mexico for the most part are all Mexicans. And yeah. it's not like there's somebody from Ireland that's just like teaching it because, um, you know, and they're just doing it for this person. It's like they're doing it because they love Irish dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny, when, when some of my Mexican dancers now would come to New York and people would say to them, oh, we love the Mexican dancing. What is it again? The the, whatever it is and they're like no we do Irish dancing isn't that fabulous yeah I just think that is just glorious that it's just got it's got wings and it's got wings we have to admit I suppose that Michael Flatley has brought it um, to a worldwide stage um, mm -hmm. it was always a wonderful art form it was always spectacular it, it you know in its in its pure Irish dancing form um, yeah, well, I suppose he, you'd have to say, like, you know, a lot of people give out about Michael Flatley, about um, different no. things about him. And there's a lot of begrudgery. People begrudge him his success. But there's no doubt. I'd that never begrudge he him. Was the one, no, I neither would I. He was the one person who you'd say had the vision to uh, bring Irish dancing onto the world stage in the way that he did. And I suppose there's other people would have said, I know it should have been the traditional dancing now up there. Not the, they shouldn't have put on those like fancy outfits for the river dance. I, you know, the way people. But it brought people to competition. Yeah. That would never have come to happen in the Irish music where every time there's like a Celtic rock band that form, people are like, oh, that's not the pure music. But it, the point is, it brings people in to the real tradition. And there's certainly yes. people around the world who discovered Irish culture through Riverdance and the shows after it. 
and have since uh, delved deeper, you'd say, to discover the pure culture and have grown uh, to have a great appreciation for Irish culture as a result of Riverland. So it has brought people in and um, it has basically opened up the culture to audiences that it never would have had, you know. And the number of times that Irish dancing was on the television in Ireland, that was great for Irish people, but nobody saw it around the nobody world. Nobody saw it. Yeah. Nobody saw it. I mean, I look back on my time, I can't find a video of, apart from weddings and things like that, of your dancing. And you're saying to yourself, you're looking back, I was talking to David Gainey now, and I mean, David does a lot of these, of these uh, collaborative um, was, yeah. shows. And he, and, and he almost apologetically um, said, well, he, didn't almost he did apologize for river for the time he was on um um uh britain's got talent and he was forced to actually dance to um somewhere over the rainbow and i oh. said you know and he said mary you know he said anyone in irish dancing knows i'm passionate about ireland and irish music yeah. i would never have wanted to ever perform to somewhere over the rainbow and um and now you know he has performed to modern singers but not mostly irish music but there was no beat and somewhere over the rainbow that was never going to be uh, there was no yeah. four four to time two four times six eight and that was never going to be david david's choice and he and anyone who knew him as a competitor or as a you know would know that wasn't his but the point i'm making is that you have people like david and and others who are actually also doing shows like Michael Flatley's, if you like, but it's all traditional music rather than um, bringing it the razzmatazz that Mike that Michael brought to it, which was glorious. Yeah. But now you have another going back to the traditional. Yeah, I think there's a lot of back and forth, and um, there's people who are brilliant dancers, and honestly, it doesn't really matter what kind of dancing they're, what kind of music they're dancing to. But, um, you know, that the thing is that it's all, I suppose you say, about engaging people and about trying to find uh, more audiences for, for the Irish culture, you know. And as I say, Riverdance was the first of its kind and there's been many shows ever since. And there's loads of great young dancers now who are starting to do a lot more videos in the current climate we're in. Um, David Ganey has been very busy, although do we know for certain that it's his feet? Maybe oh, it's they're definitely else. his feet. <laughs> I've judged him a few times. I know they're he's brilliant. I think they're definitely I think his feet. Think <laughs> but you know, I mean, as I said to him, it, beyond the feet, it's the performance element as well. And you know, you're a performer. You know that uh, somebody can be an exceptional dancer, but um, uh, yeah. it's it's to it's when you get at somebody that's an exceptional dancer who may, draws the audience in. Yeah. And, and you feel you can almost feel that they they feel it in their soul, yeah. Beyond the beyond the music, that the the music is just part of them, and yeah. um, and that's that's special when you see that in a in a competitive dancer as well as yeah. as in a stage performer that they 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 believe they feel every inch or every every beat every bar of the of of the music. And yeah, that's, that's, that some people have an innate um, musicality that's the word I and use all rhythmic. The time, yeah. yeah, they have like a, an, a rhythmic understanding of the music beyond what other people like. It's you know, it's the difference between, I suppose, just you know, dancing along while the music. And I tell my students this all the time, like you know, there's a huge difference between just dancing away and uh, hoping you're in time versus dancing exactly on the beat or dancing against the beat as it is in a lot of cases. Yeah. But the point is that you're actually providing a rhythmic commentary to the music and you're enhancing you're the telling music. Telling a story. You're so it's amazing. Yeah. You're narrating a story through your feet. That's it, exactly. And, and if you I'm took the music out, away, literally. and if you yeah. took the music away, the feet are actually, are actually the, the, the music. I mean, you yeah. know, as a musician, as an accordion player, as a, as a, as a spoon player, I've seen yeah. you playing the spoons. You know, you don't need the music because your percussive yeah. um, per percussion becomes the music, becomes yes. the rhythm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I find also when I'm adjudicating that, like, you know, you'd be watching, let's say I adjudicated now the World Championships a couple of years ago in Glasgow, and you'd be watching a recall right. on the 50 dancers, and they're all amazing. But then one comes out who's like, 
really that's amazing. it and that's exactly what i'm talking about that's exactly what i'm talking about you could have 20 30 children who could all be world champions they're all good but it's that one dancer that 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 almost lives the music that that that, that draws you in that you can you can't you're mesmerized by um and that's that's Absolutely. That's not always something you can teach. It's something innate. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. No handshakes anymore. My name is Niall O'Leary. You might know me as an adjudicator. Or maybe you've seen me play the accordion. Or maybe you've seen me play the spoons. Or maybe you've seen me dancing. Or maybe you've just never heard of me. Anyway, I want to tell you about Irish dance, the best dance for physical distancing. Irish dance is good for your health, it's good for your mind, it's good for your heart, it's good for your soul. I want to challenge you to dance every day. Maybe learn a new move, learn a new step, learn a new dance. If you dance every day, you're going to get lighter, you're going to get fitter, you're going to get thinner, and you're going to get younger. So let's all dance the jig, or the reel, or the slip jig, or the hornpipe. Let's all Irish dance. You know, you, you, you either, but you moved to, you moved stateside when? Yeah, I, I went to New York in 1996 and I mentioned earlier, I'd done a couple of tours with the cultists, with North American yeah. tours. And it was a great way of seeing um, United States and Canada. And then when I arrived, I was arrived in New York and I wasn't sure um, what I was going to do. And so um, I basically was looking for work as an architect. That's what I was looking for primarily. Is that and what your qualification is in? Architecture? Yes, in architecture. Yeah, I have two degrees in architecture from UCD. and so. Um, I went looking for an apartment and I went looking for a job around the same time and I found this lovely apartment but I couldn't afford it and then I answered an ad in the Irish Echo and I went to see an apartment in Queens New York and there was a guy there who was an Irish contractor who owned the building and he said um he says to me oh I, he says here's a here's a card of um an architect call up this architect and say you know such and such a contractor and I was like well I don't and he said well say you do so I called up this architect and um, it was a, an Irish guy who had lived in England for years and had a kind of an English accent and he says to me I have no work at the moment but I'll give you the name of three other architects and so um, I called up these three architects and I got three interviews and then um, one of the firms said to me you know we've two people here um, working here who we think are going to have to go back to where they're from in Europe in mainland Europe um, in a couple of weeks. We think they're going to have to go back, so we might have an opening. And I kept calling up this firm. I was like, oh, I was reading the New York Times today and I saw this and it reminded me of, and I kept calling them up. And then they said to me on a Friday, then a week later, they said, can you start on Monday? And I said, I'm around the corner, I can come in now. And so that was my first <laughs> Niall, you were in the right place at the right time, cute yeah. diary. And then I went back to that apartment um, that I thought it had, it had a lovely wooden floor, actually, that's why I liked it. And it was still available. And um, I'm still living there. It had a lovely wooden floor. <laughs> yeah, that's important. You saw the you know, I'm really lucky that my apartment is one I floor up. I can dance on that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's what I was thinking about. How, you read my mind, right. I'm living <laughs> above a store. It's actually um, uh, Delhi. And so um, I can dance away. And there's nobody downstairs to complain because it's a store, you know. So um, I'm very lucky that way, you know, that like to have the wooden floor and no downstairs neighbours. Amazing. So, um, so you started to integrate into the Irish community in the States. Yeah, you know. Was that, um, that probably wasn't difficult because you had the dancing and the dancing kind of gives you a doorway into many countries because you can find people, like-minded souls that you can yeah. say, 
I'm an Irish dancing teacher. I uh, ca can we meet up for coffee or whatever. I'm not very pushy. I think I'd find it hard because I'd be waiting for people to invite me. Um, yeah. I'm actually I'm very outgoing and chatty, but behind it all, I'd I'd be sitting at home waiting for people to ring me up and say, "Would you like to join us?" Yeah, well, you know what? Um, you? I was like, you know, the way a lot of Irish people now, a lot of young Irish people would come over to New York and they'd be living in Queens or the Bronx were traditionally the places where a lot of Irish people go to. Now there's a load of new young Irish professionals living in Brooklyn. Um, but the thing is that, and Manhattan as well, obviously, but I didn't have an, an immediate Irish community around me where I lived. I was living yeah. in Greenwich Village, where I st I'm still living. And so um, I found myself going out to Mineola. There's a great um, Irish-American centre in Mineola, Long Island. And I would go out there of a weekend and um, they'd have a Cayley on I think this Saturday night they still do Kayleys. And um, so I kind of connected with a lot of musicians. And then um, there was a guy who just sadly passed away recently, Pete Kelly. And he was a great uh, fiddle player, singer, music teacher. And he said to me, uh, would you be interested in playing at a fesh? There's a fesh in Long Island and I'm organizing the musicians. And so um, I started playing at the fesh in, in America. And then of course, once you get one, it leads to another. And um, I was teaching Dara Carr the dancing and I remember there was a friend of mine who said, um, there's a friend of my mother's and her daughter um, is looking for some extra help with her dancing. She's struggling and she needs some private classes. Would you be interested in teaching her? And so I was like, yeah, sure. I, and so I'd go out to their house in Queens on a Saturday and um, the girl did well in the Oireachtas then. And the mother said to me right afterwards, she said, you know, she said, um, we'd love can't to do that now. You can't and I do said, that. that sounds great, but I really don't have a dance school. I have one student. And then she said to me, why don't we start one? And that's how it happened. You can't do that now though, Niall. No, like the thing is that, um, you know, that it was very, like what, once it happened, it was very it happened, loose then, in those days. And everything, but. Yeah, but it was very loose in those days. Nowadays yeah, know, you, yeah. can't, you, you, can't, uh, you can't do private classes with people who are going to another school. Because well, you can, but as long as nobody finds out about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, know, I, wasn't, I wasn't an adjudicator or anything at the time, and um, there was no consequence. Like, there was no... Yeah, there were no... Uh, Nowadays, yeah, obviously, yeah. you know, I, Nowadays as an adjudicator, I would have to say, sorry, I can't judge this person because I've taught them a class. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Or, or, or yeah. I, can't, I, I can't do private lessons with somebody because they, they're going to another school. Yeah. yeah no, as, you wouldn't do that generally, yeah. yeah. No, but I was no. doing a friend a favour, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So Niall, you you play you play in a lot of bands. You're in a group here in Ireland. Uh, I do a lot of. Um, I suppose I'll be showing I, some of the videos or the. Yeah, I do a lot of sessions really, and I organise a lot of events, and we do a lot of entertainment. Like you know, in America now, we'd call it like corporate entertainment or doing weddings and stuff like that. And we organise a lot of music sessions for things like that. And um, I run an event on a Thursday night in Manhattan called Irish Culture Night in Paddy Riley's Music Bar. And uh, we would have been celebrating 10 years of it um, this month, except obviously the bar is closed and we're not sure when it's reopening. We'll see, hopefully New York City is uh, supposedly making progress um, better than some of the other states in America at the moment. Yeah. And so the hope is that it will be back indoors in the near future, um, but we're not sure. But the thing is that, um, yeah, in, in normal times, I'd be doing a lot of music events sessions and doing some concerts and things as well you know and so uh, my young dancing school my dancers uh, both young young ones and the adults they perform a lot as well we're very lucky that we've a lot of performing opportunities in new york city more than most places and we do a lot of performing for irish communities and also there's a load of multi-ethnic communities we perform for we've done a lot of stuff with the chinese community with the hispanic community and um, we've an African-American community that, uh, organization up in Harlem that put together some great multicultural festivals that usually take place in May and June. Uh, again, usually, meaning not this year. And um, so we do a lot of multicultural events and I have a professional dance troupe that we do a lot of weddings and, and shows as well. And I run a dance festival that's actually um, took place this year on yes. Sunday the 7th, the New York City Irish Dance Festival. 
and uh, the link is actually still up on Facebook and YouTube. Yeah, anyone can go in and watch it. And it was a great success in that we took what was always a live event. It was the 19th festival, but um, we basically turned it into a virtual festival and we did some workshops and some fairly quick workshops and we did some performances and everyone really went out of their way to figure out um, what, how, you, how you can do uh, what is normally experienced as a live performance in a virtual way. And there were some great video montages yeah. and things like that. And so you can read about it in the new Came magazine that just came out. Yeah. And um, also the, the, the festival is still up online. It's on. Um, yeah. do, um, do you find that um, now with COVID-19 restrictions and that, that um, I, don't, I know they're not as bad in the States, the restrictions. I don't think they are anyway. It as bad as they, where you are, they really are here. They're, um, they're starting to, within the next couple of days, they're starting to lift here, thank God, in this country. Um, um, I saw a, a thing the, um, last night on Facebook that said, um, since uh, when I'm thinking about um, at being antisocial and I think of my life before, um, I'm paraphrasing, uh, life before COVID-19, and since COVID-19 came in, I realized just how antisocial I always was, you know, because my life hasn't changed at all. I'm still no. doing the same things as I did uh, co uh, pre-COVID-19. So, yeah. uh, you know, apart from, I haven't been at a, I miss being at a, a dance competition. Yeah. Do you find that um, there have been any advantages to um, the way you're, you're, you're approaching music and the way you're approaching dance as, that you did, didn't think you would do? Pro yeah, uh, well, yeah there, there are definitely advantages and it's hard sometimes um, to kind of crystallize them because like the huge thing about the COVID-19 is that it has stopped us doing what we normally do. And in terms of like the scene in Irish dancing where you're going to class, you're hanging out with people in your class or you're going to a fest, you're hanging out with people there and uh, you're going to a music session, you're going to a concert. There's so many situations that are dependent on social interaction that have not been able to take place. But um, as to answer the question, yes, there are positives. And I would say in terms of the dancing, certainly um, a lot of people have got to focus on their footwork and a lot of dancing teachers have gone Very. out of their way to teach um, either video classes or Zoom classes or whatever it is. And because you don't have the space in your house, and this is particularly true it's of people living point, in dancing areas like Manhattan, there, you don't have the space in your house, and so you're focusing on the footwork. You're not able to practice the travelling moves, but you're able, able to practice your footwork. And so that I think that it's a great advantage for somebody who, like, say, maybe needed to work on their footwork, particularly, like, this time has given you the opportunity to focus on that. And there have been a lot of dancing students the world over who've really, I would say, um, made a Benefited. great progress, which we don't know about and we won't see until we're back at the fesh, at the competition. Yeah. But I think it's exciting to think that people have used this opportunity to just focus on, you know, getting their footwork more precise. And sometimes when you're focusing on moving, you might lose the footwork sometimes. And so this is an opportunity that hopefully um, people have been able to realise, you know, we can actually work on other things now that need the importance, you know, so... I think and I've taught some of my students some new steps, some new moves, some new techniques in addition to working on... Yeah, you can keep everything, you can keep everything so confined because yeah. the child is there on front of you um, and you can actually take the, 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 the zoom away from their face, from their body yeah. and just work um, for, for a period of time on the feet only and yeah. make sure that that's right. And then you can gradually move the camera to the upper part of the body so you can work on the child's upper frame. Yeah. But you know as well, I've been given people um, corrections yeah. to videos over email and they have all the corrections written in an email. So they yeah. can go through and they can process that. Where sometimes when I see somebody doing a dance that I corrected the week before, and I see them doing it the same way they did it the week before I gave them correct, like before I gave them the corrections, I'm thinking, were they listening? Did they even listen? Did they remember? And in some cases, like, you know, if the class is an hour or two hours or three hours, then you don't expect everyone to remember everything. Everything. And so now I'm thinking, do I need to give people written corrections? Maybe yeah, they I used to write all the, I used to write all the, I used to write yeah. their faults down yeah, and, exactly, yeah. and tell them what they needed to correct. And, um, or if I was teaching a new step, I'd actually, I had, I, I had a rhyme made up for the new step because I think children remember things yeah. to, to rhymes more. And um, I mean, even when I was doing my AD, 
CRJ exam, I learned all the music off with rhymes. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, you know, yeah. Do you know, I, I find rhymes are... Um, we do that too, we do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's just it, it's just it's just funny the way you try to get things into your head, and you, and you find that you know it's like um, uh, I forget what where I saw it, but they started teaching children maths to songs. Um, you know, yeah. putting putting mathematics to songs, and and the child was able to learn the times tables um, to a song because they'd remember the words of a song uh, easier than they would probably remember the times tables. But if you do that, so why can't you do it with, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, yeah. with a dance, a, a step, put the step to, um, to, to mute to a song and yeah. a song that they know the air to, and then, uh, and then they'll remember it because it's like a rhyme. It's a, yeah. Oh, it so, really, absolutely, yeah. So you're still doing the architecture? Yes, um, I have my own practice in New York City and I'm um, doing a little bit here while I'm here as well, doing some consulting kind of stuff. And so I specialize in design, in good design, basically. And um, I've done a range of different building types. If anyone's going to visit uh, New York City, um, my big public work has not been built yet, but I did design a candy <laughs> store. Again, we're using the term candy for the Americans, but I designed a sweet shop in Greenwich Village. Mm -hmm. It's called Soccer Bit, Swedish candy store, 89 Christopher Street. And um, the walls are white. The ceiling is white, the floor is white, the fixtures are white, and all the candy wrappers are coloured. So it's in Greenwich Village. Check it out when you're over. Fat well, I haven't been there now in a while. The last, the, the only qualifiers I've done in the States is the Mid-Atlantic qualifiers. Fabulous. I really enjoyed yeah. it. It was just, just, you know, they, they were lovely to us. Um, but, I, but, you know, um, it's, well, yeah, well, it's the only qualifiers I've done, but I haven't been over now since um, the last time I did Sean Regan's um, fish. Oh, right. yeah. Fabulous. Um, in yeah. February, yeah, in Long Island, I, right. Yeah, well, good. yeah, but it was February a few years ago. Right. Um, but, um, so um, what's new for Nile? What's new on the horizon? So I'm going back to New York City in a couple of weeks and um, we're actually um, celebrating later this year 25 years of the dancing school. And so um, we're putting together a big archive and um, I've loads of documentation of different things we've done, shows and like um, different events we've done over here. We've done a lot of dance dramas now. Um, we were actually planning a dance drama for the World Championships this year, which obviously didn't happen in Dublin. But we've a load of things um, that we're looking to put together a big probably online exhibition, I would say, and we're, we have a number of events coming up um, that we're planning. Uh, we're not sure when they're going to happen, but we're planning them anyway, so we're going to be ready. And uh, so there's a lot going on, and we're looking to do some performances and things outdoors over the summer. I think that's the goal, to try and keep everyone uh, going by doing outdoor now, events. Is, uh, which is the, your passion? Uh, architecture or... or, or um, uh, uh, well, you see, you have so many strings to your bows between music architecture and uh you're a renaissance man um architecture and mu music and dance and architecture yes. and irish culture mary you know i hate that question because it's like you're saying to me i have to pick Choose one the baby but i don't want to pick one i am passionate about That's okay. music, dancing architecture networking meeting people I'm passionate about everything I do, I think yes yeah, so, um, i am too i am too but i love dan i love uh, you know i suppose Dance was my first love, but I love everything I do. But it's like I was I was after coming off the stage at Milwaukee Irish Fest one year. I was performing with Mick Maloney in the Greenfields of America. And um, some guy came up to me and he says to me, he says, I hear Michael Flatley can do 30 something taps per minute. How many can you do? You know, and I was like, again, like, this is a ridiculous. Why would you want to? And you know what I said to him? I said, I can do one good one. But isn't that, isn't that, Niall, what it should be about? Quality rather than quantity. Yeah. I mean, Michael does uh, quality and quantity. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, but my uh, point know. is I don't like answering questions where the answer is very obvious, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> if, you want, if you want me to pick one, I'm not going to pick one. And if you want me to say loads, I'm just going to say one. Well, but for me, I love everything that I do, but uh, Irish or dance was my... Passion. When I lived in England, we, we were, I was in England until I was, well, I came home young, but um, I had a scholarship for ballet, but mum wouldn't stay there. Um, but dance was my love. 
always. But before we go, Niall, um, yeah. the Greenfields of America, tell me a little bit about it because we'll be showing some, I'll be showing some videos that you sent. Yes, um, so the Greenfields of America is like a collective of musicians, singers and dancers that has been going on now for over 40 years. And it was um, Dr. Mick Maloney, who's from Limerick, who put it together. And um, he's basically, over the years, uh, got some of the top talent um, to perform. And their first, as, as he says himself on the stage, he says, our first dancer was Michael Flatley. I wonder where he is now, which is gas. But um, <laughs> I've been dancing with the band now for about probably 15 or 18 years. I lost count, actually. But we do a lot of different concerts. We did a couple of concerts uh, for the 40th anniversary a couple of years ago um, in Dublin. We did some concerts in Dublin Castle. And then just last year, we did the uh, In Bulk Festival in Derry. And we also did the Celtic Connections Festival in Glasgow, which we'd done before, but it was amazing. It's always brilliant. And so uh, in the last now uh, couple of months, um, obviously there's, there hasn't been anything happening in terms of live concerts, but Mick Maloney put together an, an online concert, a virtual concert just in the past week called Infinite Hope. And it's a concert in support of basically the Black Lives Matter movement. And basically um, the concert is about showing, I suppose you'd say solidarity with our black and brown neighbors and friends. And that basically what we're saying is that um, it's about basically focusing on people who have clearly, you'd say not, they're, as a race, they have not um, been dealt well by society um, in the past. And so we want to make a difference. And I think that's the big difference now in the world that everyone is on board. Whereas years ago, you'd be inclined to think, oh, that's not my issue, but it is everyone's issue at the moment. And so we did a concert, um, which you can see on, and I think I, I sent you a link to my performance in it, but there's also a link to the whole concert. And it was over two hours long, with some amazing performances um, from some well-known singers and musicians. Uh, well, oh, They're all well-known in America, but um, most of them would be well-known here as well, I would say. And so there was some great talent in the concert, both um, singing and music and some dance, there were some dancers as well in it. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing. So definitely well, well, Niall, it was absolutely joyous talking to you. It really was. It's always great talking to colleagues. Great, Mary. Yeah, I remember uh, the last time we had a long chat like this was actually on the radio. So it was great to That's see right. you. That's right. It was with a former station. Yes. yes. And so, uh, yeah, so it was Hi fantastic. To and hope to see everyone uh, back out dancing away uh, very soon. Thank you, Niall. And I hope to see you soon too. And continued much. success. Great. Thank you. Great. God bless. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, kids. Thanks. This is Mick Maloney here in Bangkok, Thailand, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our concert, Infinite Hope. And uh, the name is actually taken from a Martin Luther King quote, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. So over the next two hours, you will be hearing and seeing performances from some of the finest Irish traditional musicians, singers and dancers in the United States and in Ireland and indeed beyond as well. Well, the question might be, why a concert? Well, in every protest movement I know about or have ever been involved in, the arts have played a prominent role. Every oppressive regime I have heard of has a history of silencing, jailing, and sometimes executing its artists. And artists everywhere have a long history of speaking up when others choose to stay silent. There is nothing, of course, inherently political about singing a song or playing a reel or a jig and doing a dance, but when Irish and Irish-American artists come together in common cause to protest injustice and oppression, then that, collectively, is a loud and public shout-out for human rights, dignity, and social justice for all our people in the United States of America and across the world at this time particularly those who have been oppressed and marginalised and, yes, terrorised often on a daily basis. 
and why our music, song and dance? Well, these arts might enjoy a measure of privilege in today's world, but historically they came out of hard times. We Irish at home were colonized for many centuries and denied basic human rights, including the right to vote for most of that time. And at various times in our history, our music, song, dance and poetry were banned from public performance or dissemination, often under penalty of death. We were forced to emigrate by poverty, famine and persecution. And then in our new home across the Atlantic Ocean, we often found ourselves very unwelcome visitors. So while we can never even begin to understand the horrors of black slavery, we can and should identify with suffering and bigotry and also with the resilience and sense of purpose that can bring us beyond suffering to a better place in our society. So today, we stand shoulder to shoulder through our art with our oppressed black and brown brothers and sisters and indeed fellow relatives, and I'm not just speaking metaphorically. My fellow colleague, fellow artist, and I would say blood brother, Lenny Sloan, who will essentially be co-hosting this concert with me, drew my attention some decades ago to an extraordinary statistic that most Americans are not even aware of. It's the Harvard University study that cited the fact that 38% of African Americans have Irish DNA. 38%. Both Michelle and Barack Obama, just to take two prominent Americans, belong in that remarkable number. And then that begs the question, if 38% of African Americans have Irish DNA, then how many Irish Americans have African American DNA? In one sense, that does not matter because we are all human beings and should enjoy equality and the same opportunities and rights. There is no room in our society, in our world, for racism or bigotry, none whatever. We begin our concert with a newly composed song written and performed by one of the most brilliant musicians and singers of our time, John Doyle, originally from Dublin, currently living in Asheville, North Carolina. So let the revels of solidarity begin. They are coming, their hate will scorch the land. They'll steal in with a whisper and soon force their demands. When I was young and full of fun, I never dreamed I'd seen a day that democracy would be flaunted, abused, and thrown away. So stand up and be counted, rise up and be strong. Together we will win the day, divided now we'll fall. Stand up and be counted, rise up and be strong. Together we will win the day, divided now we'll fall. Divided now we'll fall. A thin line divides us between peace and hostility. Some crave fame and power, the road to insanity. Well, just think about our children and what world will they see? A land of peace and plenty, or wars and brutality. So stand up and be counted, rise up and be strong. Together we will win the day, divided now we'll fall. Stand up and be counted, rise up and be strong. Together we will win the day, divided now we'll fall. Divided now we'll fall Oh, there's a world of riches For everyone to share It's not just for those fat cats But people everywhere Some may smile and shake your hand And tell you that they care But the other hand's in your pocket Robbing you of your share so it's stand up and be counted, rise up and be strong. Together we will win the day, divided now we'll fall. 
strong Stand up and be counted Rise up and be strong Together we will win the day Divided now we'll fall Divided now we'll fall Well, they'd like us to call them masters Or call them kings and queens But they're just liars and racists Con men and petty thieves Oh, hard times are a-coming Fascism's on the rise Compassion is their enemy There's hatred in their eyes But unity will win the day If we stick together we'll be strong We won't let hate defeat us Let's choose right over wrong So stand up and be counted Rise up and be strong Together we will win the day Divided now we'll fall Stand up and be counted Rise up and be strong Together we will win the day Divided now we'll fall Divided now we'll fall So, hello to the world. I'm Lenny Sloan. I'm here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in the United States of America, and I want to say hello, uh, Godspeed, and send solidarity to our friends around the world, around the globe, and especially in Ireland. I'm a board member of the African American Diaspora Network. I am the great, great grandchild of Thomas More Sr. from Kilkenny, who was born in 1826 in Kilkenny and who sailed to America with his wife in 1846 to New York City. He was a political renegade and he headed off to Minneapolis and St. Paul where he had a son in 1861, my great-grandfather. Now, Minneapolis is the place where George Floyd was murdered, and so it's an irony that my history connects with that place. He, my great-great-grandfather, joined the first Minneapolis volunteer soldiers in the Civil War years of 1863, and he was shipped off to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is about 30 minutes from where I'm sitting now. He was in the Battle of Gettysburg. Shortly after that, the first Minneapolis, which was an all-Irish brigade, was sent to New York City to put down the riots between the Irish and the black community, better known as the draft riots. And so he fought for the Union uh, to end slavery, and then he went to New York, much like the militias that we find in our streets in New York tonight, to put down the revolt and the rebellion. There's lots of ironies. Another irony was that George in his death and with his last breath cried out to his mother using his mother's name mama mama and it still burns in my mind that the image that his mother would be reaching out to him to lift him from that pain of his last breath and so I wanted to share this poem to you by Langston Hughes. It's called Mother to Son. And it's to all the sons all around the world who are out in the street tonight protesting for equity, parity, and inclusion. 
And it's from all the mothers who are telling them not to give up. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stairs. It's been hard tacks and splinters and, and boards torn up and places where there was no carpet, where the, the floor was bare, but all the time I've been a climbing and a, and a reaching and turning corners and, and sometimes going into the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps. Don't you give up because you can't find a place to rest and you, you find it hard because, honey, eyes still climbing and life for me ain't been no crystal stairs. Hi folks, how you going? My name is Karen Casey and I was delighted to be asked um, to be involved in this project um, showing solidarity with the black community in America. This is um, a song called Freedom Never Falls From The Skies. This buffoon, he came down from his tower Well, he struts his stuff, yeah, he loves his power And sucks all the air from every room he takes the shine from the silver and he speaks too soon and his voice it goes boom 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 he keeps nothing in store with his quest for more on the white house lawn fattens the golden calf he lines the ice pockets of his chiefs of staff and his corporate friends down on K Street. They make sure to take him to the meet and greet with a silver spoon in his mouth. He thinks it gives him the right to shout and shout He can hide behind the desk He can hide behind the suit He can hide all the bodies He can count all the loot Freedom never falls from the skies Like the arc of truth let it rise Freedom never falls from the skies Let's keep our eyes on the prize And his hair is like a blackbird's beak And at the weekend he just tweets and tweets He tells us all to go out in the sun He tells us all to go and have some fun to Drink Lysol and hydrochloroquine And in our hour of need All he talks of is his greed He keeps his friends in their high places And they hide behind their corporate faces Freedom never falls from the skies Like the arc of truth Freedom never falls from the skies. Let's keep our eyes on the prize. Trump and Jim Crow, well, they're best friends now. They hold hands and walk down the street together in sunny side near New York town. Well, there's a woman there who can bring him down. Alexandria Casey, a Cortez is her name, and hey, why don't we vote for her instead? Freedom never falls from the skies like the arc of truth. Freedom never falls from the 
scones. Let's keep our eyes on the prize. Hi, this is Tim Britton coming to you from Fairfield, Iowa, playing in solidarity with the Black Lives Movement. As Irish musicians, we have a wonderful opportunity to connect with each other on a level that transcends the struggle and strife that so many of us face on a daily basis. Certainly this has, uh, Irish music has played this role for millennia in uh, rather adverse conditions. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to play you a couple of very old piping jigs, and these two are marches. And it's always struck me as interesting that um, a lot of the old marches are these beautiful, mellifluous, sweet jigs. And I always have this uh, image of people uh, marching in this beautiful spring day. And somehow, even though there's this concerted effort, uh, there's also a sense of joy in life on a very basic level that uh, goes beyond all the rest of it. So uh, the first one of these is called Alstrom's March, and the second one is called the March of the Maguires. This is Robbie O'Connell in County Waterford in Ireland and this is a song I wrote back in 1990 called The Winning Side. Another hour has passed away, another 
stony turning moment of another endless day the things changed at all he still walks from wall to wall and every year that passes by will be one less year for living when he finally steps outside the heavy price to pay Waste your life away Ah, but justice is a fickle thing One law for the common man Another for the king And don't you know when kings can't win the game It won't be long till all the rules have changed it's all justified when you're on the winning side. Man who stands in jail today who will become tomorrow's leader. That's how history often plays. Price it's understood. Sometimes paid in blood but When the battle lines are drawn Who can foretell Who'll be the one To play the king or play the pawn Who will bear the blame In such a deadly game Ah, but justice is a fickle thing Common man, another for the king. And don't you know when kings can't win the game? It won't be long till all the rules are changed, and it's all justified when you're on the winning side. time to be held without a charge to be condemned without a crime cruel irony in the land of liberty when it comes to human rights why is it always in some foreign land we choose to stand and fight when will we realize What's right before our eyes Ah, but justice is a fickle thing One law for the common man Another for the king And don't you know when kings can't win the game It won't be long till all the rules are changed it's all justified when you're on the winning side. Oh, it's all justified when you're on the winning side. Hi, I'm Niall O'Leary and I'm here in Dublin, Ireland, where it's a little bit cloudy, a little bit overcast, but we're used to that. But I'm here today with an important message for all of you. But the message does not contain the word all.
Black Lives Matter. I'm Liz Carroll, and I'm in Chicago. Peace. Hello, I'm Jerry Timlin coming to you from Bethany Beach, Delaware, and I'm humbled to be part of this concert. Having grown up in Northern Ireland, I've seen discrimination, abuse of power, and social injustice firsthand. This must stop. And so, in solidarity with our black and brown brothers and sisters, I'm going to sing you a beautiful song written by Scotsman Alan Bell, A Parting Glass. <laughs> When first we met, complete awkward strangers, we did not know if we could be friends, how soon we've come, for to know each 
each other And now I know We will meet again So here's to you And our time together I'll share with you A parting glass And I'll bid adieu With some smiles and laughter Our time apart Will be short and past We've talked of dreams And of new tomorrows Of yesterday And it's dark despair We've had our share Of love and sorrow And now we part As friends who care So here's to you And our time together I'll share with you A parting glass And I'll bid adieu With some smiles and laughter Our time apart Will be short and pass A long, long road It lies before me And fate will take me where it will But through the valleys And over mountains I'll not forget But remember you still So here's to you And our time together I'll share with you A parting glass And I'll bid adieu with some smiles and laughter Our time apart Will be short and pass Our time apart Will be short and pass Hello, I'm Eve Telford and I live in Cove, County Cork. This is one of my own protest songs, River of Revolution. Who is that boy with the scarred eyes? He's just another victim of wartime. He lost his family and his tiny home And he's forgotten by the world The soldiers who murdered his family Are revered as heroes here Who is that girl in the tight cell? She spoke up for those in Guantanamo. Now she has been tortured and she could die. And she's forgotten by most of our kind. The leaders who locked her in darkness are revered by the people worldwide. But a river of revolution is flowing underground One day it will reach the surface Holding hands and speaking loud And this river of revolution can be seen if you try 
in a peace flag flying, or the release from torture, or the man who's just a child. Who is that man in the small slum? He works like a dog to feed his children. His family are starving and the baby died And he's forgotten in our time The owners of the nearby oil company Hold parties in their mansions all night Who is that woman on the thin raft She's leaving her homeland of war and blood. No country will save her and she will drown. And she's forgotten by the people around. The leaders who chose not to save her are worshipped on TV screens. But a river of revolution is flowing underground. One day it will reach the surface, holding hands and a speaking loud. And this river of revolution can be seen if you try in a peace flag flying or the release from torture. Of a man who's just a child Of a man who sometimes smiled You know, when the idea of this concert first came up, uh, the very first musician to say, I'm in, enthusiastically, was my old friend and musical colleague for many decades, uh, the wonderful Jimmy Keane from Chicago. Uh, Jimmy is the master of the Stomach Steinway, the piano accordion, and has been All-Ireland champion on that instrument on numerous occasions. Uh, Jimmy played a very moving lament for George Floyd and Eric Garner uh, and intersperses the music with uh, memorable quotes from prominent Americans from our time, African-Americans and some who are not. Jimmy Keane. <laughs>
Hello everyone, I'm Joni Madden, and I'm coming to you from my home in Yonkers, New York. And I'm honored to take part in this concert today and show my solidarity for all my black and my brown brothers and sisters. I have to say, the one thing I have always loved about Irish music is that people from all walks of life and ethnic groups have all come to this music for some reason, and everyone is welcome at the session. And I've invited a couple of great friends of mine to play, um, join me in a couple of reels that I composed. Gabriel Donahue is on piano. Gabe is all the way from Athen Ryan County, Galway, and now makes his home in Philadelphia. And uh, also have the great Josh Dukes, all the way from uh, Washington, D.C. area, and an All-Ireland champion. And Josh is an African-American. On percussion, I've invited Emmadine Rivera, who's played on a number of my CDs. And Emmadine is a, a Puerto Rican American, makes his home now in New Jersey. And also the wonderful Joe Dwyer, all the way from Brooklyn, New York. And Joe is an Indian Irish American uh, and amazing dancer and a student of the great Donnie Golden. I hope this concert brings us a bit of healing and brings awareness to social injustices that should never, ever happen again, what happened to George Floyd and his murder. I also want to say I do stand with my blue brothers and sisters, and I feel that um, they deserve our admiration and respect. Don't let the, the, the actions of a few bad apples ruin the reputation of a, a police force that get up out of bed every day and go to work and put their lives on the line to protect all of us. Anyway, folks, thanks for letting me be a part of this. And I hope this horrible stain in our history is never repeated. I hope we learn from it and I hope we grow from it and we come out better and more aware and more decent towards our fellow citizens. We should never be judged by the pigment of our skin. We should be judged by our character. Thank you very much and uh, peace, everybody. Three, four.
My name is James Keane. I'm originally from Dublin, Ireland. I've been stateside now for the last 52 years, and I live in Queens, New York. Here are a few personal thoughts. We shouldn't have to wait for a black man to die in order to show solidarity with our Native American black and brown brothers and sisters. We are not going to find a total solution to racism in a few weeks, but for people to succeed, give them the tools and resources they need, lowering the cost of healthcare, making college more affordable, fighting income in inequality, and by making it so that our black brothers and sisters make ends meet by work, working one job. In solidarity with those thoughts, I'm going to play a couple of tunes for you. The first one is called Shreve Russell, and the second one is Old Tipperary. force were unarmed and still to this day they are unarmed the Gordi Shikana the 
custodians of the peace in the Irish language. And similarly, our neighbouring countries, uh, Scotland, England, Wales, choose uh, to go with unarmed police. It was quite a shock when I came to America 47 years ago and encountered the realities of a, a gun culture. And I'll never forget the day that I was first stopped while driving uh, by the police and uh, I pulled over and the squad car pulled over behind me and the officer got out and walked slowly to my car and I lowered the window and suddenly there was a gun one foot from my head. I found it positively chilling. And to this day, after all these decades, I still find it chilling when that happens. I cannot even begin to imagine what it's like for my brown and black brothers and sisters when they're similarly stopped. I'm going to read you a poem, and this was written by a person who lived in Philadelphia, as I did myself for 28 years, uh, and uh, his name is Ross Gay. Uh, he got his PhD from Temple University, not too far away from Germantown, where I lived for most of those years. And here's a poem he wrote called Pulled Over in Short Hills, New Jersey, 8 a.m. It's the shivering. When rage grows hot as an army of red ants and forces the mind to quiet the body, the quakes emerge, sometimes just the knees, but at worst through the hips, chest, neck, until like a virus slipping inside the lungs and pulse, every ounce of strength tapped to squeeze words from my taut lips his eyes scanning my car's insides, my eyes, my license. And as I answer the questions three, four, five times, my jaw tight as a vice, his hand massaging the gun butt, I imagine things I don't want to. And inside beg this to end before the shiver catches my hands and he sees and something happens. I'd like to read another poem written by Ross Gay. And this is about Eric Garner. And as many of us know, um, Eric Garner died in a chokehold. He was asphyxiated by a member of the NYPD on July the 17th, 2014. His alleged crime was selling single cigarettes. And during the course uh, of his death, he shouted 11 times, I can't breathe. His death was ruled a homicide. Uh, and despite that, uh, he was acquitted. And uh, it took the NYPD five years to dismiss him from the force. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Recreation Horticulture Department, which means perhaps that with his large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants, which most likely, some of them in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do like house and feed small and necessary creatures. Like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Hidden knee to the neck Is something you can't forget when you see it once Did they pull it while running? Did they do it just for fun? I've got a hunch Well, it's the same old story You would have thought we moved along Now everybody points the finger Saying which side are you on? Is it the side of judgment with the eyes 
eyes of God staring you down hard With a sign of love Martin Luther only came so far Is it the side of JFK Who saw the broken cogs and made the wheel Whatever side you're on Don't let the devil make the deal Riots on the street I'm feeling like I've seen all this before Buildings burning down But the one who wears the crown does nothing more They're an instigating enemies Turning every friend to fool There's so many ways of thinking Which way will you go? Is it the side of judgment With the eyes of God staring you down hard? Is it the side of love Martin Luther only came so far? Is it the side of JFK Who saw all the broken cards and made the wheel? Whatever side you're on Don't let the devil make the deal To all those blinded by privilege Brainwashed into thinking nothing's wrong And those hearts filled with hatred Knowing nothing's changed for far too long Well now has come the time To look and see just who you are Yes, it's history in the making We say you did your part Are you on the side of judgment With the eyes of God staring you down hard? Are you on the side of love Martin Luther only came so far Are you on the side of JFK Who saw all the broken cogs and made this real Whatever side you're on Don't let the devil make the deal Yeah, whatever side you're on Don't let the devil make the deal I'm Kieran Jordan in Boston, Massachusetts, sharing my voice and my dance in solidarity with Black Lives and for racial justice and equality in the U.S. and around the world. In this dance, I'll be joined by my friends Matt and Shannon Heaton playing the Golden Castle Hornpipe as a slow air, a lament. As we live with the global threat of coronavirus, a virus that causes respiratory illness, as we hear George Floyd's tragic last words, I can't breathe, now a cry for global change. In this dance, I invite you to breathe with me.
Good evening, folks. Welcome. My name is Donnie Carroll, and uh, I've been singing for the last, since the mid-60s, singing folk music and stuff like that. And it's nice to be a part of this here tonight, this uh, program. Um, when I started singing way back then, I, I suppose I, I just sang really for the, the sake of singing. I enjoyed singing, you know, that, that uh, effort that comes out of you. But, you know, it wasn't that important, really, like what I was singing about. I just wanted to sing. But it being the 60s, um, lots of events were happening at the time. And uh, notably, like uh, the war in Vietnam, civil rights, troubles in Ireland, anti-apartheid. You know, it could go on and on. And around that time, of course, the... Um, the folk scene, uh, the folk scene came into the, to the homes of, of most people. We had lots of songs were written by the folk uh, musicians at that time. And, uh, you know, um, one of the songs that was written around that time was a song written by Bob Dylan called um, The Times They Are Changing. So uh, that's the song that I'm going to sing right now. So I hope you enjoy it. Was blind, 
but now I see. They sang this song, the city council of Minneapolis, when they addressed the protesters. They sang this song when they wheeled George Floyd's body into the funeral home. They sang it as the family marched out of the church. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. But did you know that that song was written by an Irishman by the name of John Newton in 1779? Newton was a strange man. He uh, was born in County Donegal in Ireland, and, and he was a slave runner, which meant that he carried slaves on his ship illegally from the port of sale to the market. And in one, uh, one cargo transfer, he came upon a storm. Now, According to the story, the ship which John Newton was on was tossed by the waves and, and the enslaved in the bow of the ship with their chains rocking against, he could hear their moaning and their wailing, save me, save me. And the ship crashed against the rocks and the boards and was thrown up into splinters and, and John Newton himself was thrown overboard and he thought he was going to drown. Well, there was an enslaved man whose chains on the side of the ship actually saved his life because that piece of wood that he was chained to became a raft. And he was floating by and he heard John Newton wailing and crying out for help in the brine and the tossing water and he reached down and he pulled John Newton up out of the water and onto that board and he saved John Newton's life that day. Newton, the slaver from Donegal, was transformed in that experience. He became an Anglican priest in the church of England and he became an abolitionist and he wrote Amazing Grace in 1779 as a Christmas sermon to speak about how blind he was to another man's servitude but how that man knew that the sins of the father should not fall upon the son and he saved John Newton so that John Newton might be raised up and join the abolitionists and the anti-slavery cause. But you know what? It's ironic about fate because John Newton later in his life actually became blind. And that man who he saved, that man who saved him, became his guide and his eyes. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see through many a dangerous toils and snares I have already come to grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. I hope you're singing with me because Amazing Grace which was adopted by the Southern Baptist Church in 1860, became a folk song by 1920, and was picked up by the Civil Rights Movement in 1960, and the folk movement 
in the 60s and the 70s, and today it is sung across the world and translated into 88 languages. It has become a song to the masses that grace, grace is our glue for solidarity. Grace is our hope for the future. It will take grace for us to overcome this pandemic period. A pandemic of health, a pandemic of economy, pandemic racism and suppression, pandemic dispute over justice, equality and parity. I hope that we can knit ourselves together like a crazy quilt and that we can apply grace to this situation. So every time you hum amazing grace, think of John Newton and think of fate and providence saving him from himself. Think of the grace of that man who could have, should have, and would have let him drown had he not believed, had he not had a heart had he not had humanity. Hi everyone, I'm Haley Richardson. I'm from North Carolina. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Mick for putting this whole thing together and uh, asking me to be a part of it. I'm really honored to be among so many fantastic musicians who are using their voices and their instruments um, to show a sign of support and solidarity for the black community at this time. Um, thank you to everybody who is contributing um, in whatever way you are, not just to this concert, um, but to the movement as a whole. Um, it's it's a big time of education and learning for a lot of us, and um, it's really a privilege to, to learn about these things secondhand rather than experiencing them firsthand. Um, and I'm really happy to contribute in a way uh, that I find very near and dear to my heart, which is through music. And um, I think those of us who play music or just appreciate music um, know that it's a very powerful thing. So very happy to be a part of this and um, I'm going to play something that I wrote for this specifically because I wasn't sure quite what to play. Um, so I figured I'd just write something entirely new. Um, so I hope you enjoy it and I hope you're all staying well and uh, thanks so much.
Hello, my name's John Roberts. I live in upstate New York, and I'm honored to have been invited to join Irish musicians in support of our black and brown brothers in their struggle. Black Lives Matter. I sing mostly old songs. This one was written around 1850, a song of the history of Ireland. And uh, it was printed and sold as a penny song sheet, sold on the streets of Belfast, sold on the streets of England. The copies that I've seen have been printed in England as well as in Ireland. It's a song that uses the metaphor of spinning, still in vogue today, and it's called The Wheels of the World. True sons of air and attend to these few simple lines. I'll sing you a song about spinning. It was a good trade in old times. Some they spun worsted and yarn, others spun flax and spun tow. By experience now you may learn how the winds of the world they do go. And these are the wheels of the world, my friends, you must all understand. For three hundred years they've been spinning destruction all over the land. Martin Luther, he was a great spinner, and so was King Henry VIII. John Calvin, by Satan's temptations, their maxims he did imitate. Then Cranmer, he joined the new system, he swore he'd make spindles of steel. Pluto himself did assist him, perdition was turning their wheel. And these are the wheels of the world, my friends, you must all understand. For three hundred years they've been spinning destruction all over the land. William Pitt, he was a great spinner, as also was Lord Castlereagh. They spun out a union for Ireland, to England they shipped it away. Pitt spun out his existence, crossed over on Karen's old boat. Lord Castlereagh saved the distance by slitting the rim of his throat. And these are the wheels of the world, my friends, you must all understand. For three hundred years they've been spinning destruction all over the land. And Napoleon was a great spinner, he freedom did always advance over deserts, high lofty mountains, he marched with the brave sons of France. But Wellington too went to spinning, his wheels they were at Waterloo. Ah, but Grouchy had never been bribed, well the French would have split him in two. But these are the wheels of the world, my friends, you must all understand. For three hundred years they've been spinning destruction all over the land. And the factory owners are spinning, their wheels they are turning away. Now they're expecting their workers to slave thirteen hours a day. They don't give a damn for the poor, they heed not their sighs nor their moans. They don't give a pin if they spin till they spun all the flesh from their bones. And these are the wheels of the world, my friends, you must all understand. For three hundred years they've been spinning destruction all over the land. And the rich, they're all famous spinners, of that we are very well sure. Always contriving and scheming to grind down the rights of the poor. So if you intend to go spinning, be sure that your spindles are steel. Let liberty then be your motto, and glory will turn your big wheel. And these are the wheels of the world, my friends, you must all understand. For three hundred years they've been spinning destruction all over the land. Yes, these are the wheels of the world, my friends, you must all understand. For three hundred years they've been spinning destruction all over the land. This is Kyrie Best coming to you from Maplewood. You know, peace, love, and enjoy.
Hello folks, this is Tony DeMarco from Brooklyn and I'm here to play a tune for you in solidarity with the black and brown brothers and sisters and the situation at hand. And this is a little song called The Wind That Shakes the Barley, which has a verse in there that's very uh, similar to their struggle right now. You can look it up on Google and uh, check out the lyrics. I'm Jimmy Crowley and I'm in the town of Cove in Cork Harbour in the south of Ireland. And this is my good friend John Crone on the high string guitar. We're going to sing a song of freedom, a song called Easter Week 2016. Saxville Street Can you hear the firing Down below The sound of freedom The GPO Hall Easter week 2016 A strolling down O'Connell Street I met a man Where all ghosts grin Said son we'll have to Rise again what is freedom when all is lost? An English tongue, an Irish cost, and Cromwell's brood in the media. Taking good care of Britannia. Easter week, 1916. They sang the wearing of the green but now they sing the cockamus of painted fools nefarious Easter week 2016 beware the new murder machine it's spit and steel that grisly mill the Irish kitchen it must kill For what is freedom When all is lost An English tongue An Irish cast Cromwell's brood In the media Taking good care of Britannia Easter week 2016 I thought I heard a young girl keen Up and down Clan Brazil Street To all the people that she'd meet Is Michel Eire, is Stuart Machoosh Ni launach bearma, erea machloosh But noble men and women too Will come my honour 
to do For what is freedom when all is lost An English tongue, an Irish cost And crumbles brewed in the media Taking good care of Britannia A hundred years ago today Brave men bled their lives away Rebel voices they sang and said Tear gone tongue, tear gone spread Quizzling stone my wheel away And Irish law recedes each day The Bundesbank they now proclaim And we're a province once again For what is freedom? When all is lost An English tongue An Irish cost And crumbles blue In the media Taking good care of Britannia who died for liberty have heard the eagle scream all the ones who died for liberty have died but for a dream oh rise arise Rise, dark horse on the wind For in no nation on the earth More broken dreams you'll find The flames leaped high Reach to the sky and seared a nation's soul in the ashes of our broken dreams. We've lost sight of our goal. Oh, rise, rise. Rise, dark horse on the wind, and help our hearts seek Roisin, her soul again to find. Now charlatans, they wear dead men's shoes and rattle dead man's bones. Where the dust has settled on their tombs, they've sold their very stones. Oh, rise, 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 dark horse on the wind. For in no nation on the earth, more Pharisees you'll find. In grief and hate, our motherland, her dragon's teeth have sown, and the warriors rise from the earth for to maim and kill. Rise, rise, dark horse on the wind For the one-eyed ballad still reigns king 
in our nation of the blind. Hi, I'm Daniel Neely. This is Shea Coyle and this is Eugene Bender. We're here to play a few tunes in solidarity with our black, indigenous, and people of color comrades who have lived an historically complex existence and whose struggle we're beginning to better understand now. We're here to play, we're here to listen, and we're here to learn how to become better people. We're going to play three tunes today. The first one is an air for a song called Wheels of the World. The second is called Lilies in the Field. And the third is called Craig's Pipes. Jake James from New York City. I hope everyone's staying safe. And I thought I would quickly repeat one of President Obama's favorite Martin Luther King quotes. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice.
After I came to America in 1973, I lived in Philadelphia for the next 30 years and 28 of those years I spent in Germantown, an overwhelmingly African-American part of the city. And I saw the daily sight of white motorists rolling up the windows in their cars and locking the doors when they were driving through the hood. I became familiar with the daily indignities suffered by young black men, how when they went to a supermarket, they were often followed around by security guards observing their every movement. Their mothers would tell them always to be sure and get a receipt for everything they bought and always have ID with them wherever they went. The list of daily indignities went on and on. I must say I enjoyed those 30 years immensely and was awed by the humour, warmth and in particular the patience and tolerance of my African-American neighbours. In the early 1990s I made my first trip to Montserrat which is often known as the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean and I was fascinated about that. I was curious about the Irish identity that the island was known for in general. And then when I went, I learned that most of the people there had Irish names and that we Irish had become slave owners there after originally being transplanted forcibly to the West Indies as indentured servants as far back as the 17th century. I learned that the so-called Black Irish of Montserrat were mostly not Irish at all, but African Caribbean people who had taken their Irish names from their masters because they had no English names of their own. There are those recently who for their own reasons have equated the suffering of the Irish transplanted by the likes of Oliver Cromwell to the Caribbean for indentured servitude to the suffering of Africans in slavery. But while we may have suffered the same indignities and suffering, only our labour was sold, never our bodies. In slavery, as we know, the whole body and progeny of the body became the property of the slave owner. That never happened to us. During my many visits to Montserrat, I met the distinguished historian Howard Fergus, uh, and he makes this point as well. He wrote this book, uh, The History of the Island of Montserrat, and uh, I'd like to quote from him on the chapter uh, that is titled Irish and African Emancipation. There was really no comparison between the horrors of black slavery and the discrimination against Irish Catholics in Montserrat. But both groups in their different ways hankered after freedom. The slaves needed basic personal liberty, while the Irish always struggled for civil and political equality with other whites. The latter achieved their goal six years before emancipation, but this was no more the fruit of human kindness than was emancipation purely the result of humanitarian action. Freedom. We both longed and still long for freedom and social justice, basically an even playing field for all. We Irish Americans of all people have absolutely no right whatever to be racist at any time. We must not forget that not too long ago, we newly arrived Irish along with African Americans were considered by the American establishment, the wealthy and the powerful, as barely human. In fact, as subhuman. Irish Americans, of course, are now part of our privileged establishment in the United States. But we must never cease to remember the struggle our forebears went through when they arrived in the land of liberty. One of the ways that struggle is documented has always been through our songs. I'm going to sing one of the many songs from our tradition and the negative images we had to face then, uncannily similar to those images of black and brown minorities that proliferate today. It is called Do Me Justice, and I can thank the wonderful Len Graham from County Antrim for first drawing this song to my attention. And joining me for this song, all the way from Italy, is the wonderful Athena Turgis. Hello, everyone. Athena Turgis here in Tuscany, central Italy, together with all our sisters and brothers worldwide, united in our stand against racial discrimination and oppression. 
Over the last 20 years, I've been so fortunate to join Dr. McMaloney and the Greenfields of America in celebrating unique ethnic cultures and traditional art forms in many parts of the world. What strikes me the most while exploring cultural diversity is how we humans at our core share the same basic values worldwide. Dignity, self-determination, security, and leisure time to spend together. These are all prerequisites for many enduring forms of cultural expression. Artists can open the windows and shed light on the soul of our cultures. We can all create opportunities to listen, understand, and appreciate fellow human beings. I invite you all to open your windows with us and sing, play, or shout until our collective voices are heard. Well, here I am from Donegal, and I'm all discontented For to see the way we're all put down as highly represented For you see, it is a general rule to make part of the neighbour a fool But never mind, we'll play it cool And we'll stand up for old Ireland Do me justice, treat me fair and I'll not be discontented And I'll not be laughed at anywhere But highly represented Now Mr. Punch in his literature He treats us very badly And when he draws his caricatures He presents us very sadly With crooked limbs and villainous face He thus depicts the Irish race We think it is a sad Do me justice, treat me fair, and I'll not be discontented, and I'll not be laughed at anywhere but highly represented. When on the stage I do appear with a trumpet and big shillady, and a ragged coat and tattered clothes, you think I come up gaily. With not a word of common sense, they don't care that they give offence. But they carry on at past expense Just let them come to Ireland Do me justice, treat me fair And I'll not be discontented And I'll not be laughed at anywhere But highly represented They say we're dirty and lazy lot But what's the use to grumble? For if they should enter an Irish cot They're made welcome though and in public works the country round Where air hard work is to be found In the railway tunnels underground You'll find the boys from Ireland Do me justice, treat me fair And I'll not be discontented And I'll not be laughed at anywhere But I be represented Very true, I like a glass of porter or of whiskey, and I'm partial to a pretty lass, she'd make me feel quite frisky. I am very quiet when left alone, but I'll do what I like with what's me own, and woe be to the foes of home that would dare to run down Ireland. Do me justice, treat me fair, and I'll not be contented, and I'll not be laughed at anywhere, but highly represented. Uh, we are uh, the McConaughey's here. I'm going to the is my son Sean, and this is Mikey. We all play uh, the Irish accordion, and we're going to play two reels from you that were that, that I, I learned these couple of reels. Uh, from the Old Bay Cayley Band. It's, it was the, the second Cayley Band uh, in, the, in the Baltimore, Washington area. 
And in my opinion, it, it's the best scale again. It's still really good. And the first tune uh, is a composition of the great Chris Droney from County Clare. And the second one was found uh, by Jim Egan, one of the great fiddle players here. And he, he was down in Hamilton, right? Yeah. In, in Baltimore. And what are the names of the two tunes, John? They are called The Bell Harbor and To the Lasses of St. Mary's. That's right. Okay. So have fun. Michelle Mulcahy and I'm joining you from Limerick in the southwest of Ireland tonight. As part of the Infinite Hope concert tonight I would like to play a piece of music for you on the Irish harp and this piece I composed a couple of years ago uh, which is called uh, the Corinne March and I wrote this uh, march uh, which is very much symbolic of hope um, after meeting the Corinne community in Myanmar who suffered decades of uh, social injustice and oppression. And so tonight I would like to play this march, uh, which is symbolic of hope, hope for this freedom from oppression and hope for social justice. And I stand with you all in solidarity tonight uh, to one of the most powerful communicators of all, which is music.
is Tommy Sands and I'm coming to you from Rostrever in County Town and I'm delighted to be taking part in this great event. Thank you Mick Maloney for inviting me along uh, with uh, great friends and musicians, wonderful musicians from all arts and parts and scatterments around the world. Just outside my house here is a little pier and from there people sail for America. Many never came back. Some died of homesickness. Being Irish, we know about immigration, forced immigration, about discrimination and inequality. And being Irish, not to identify with that in the members of our own human family is not to be Irish at all. This is a song I wrote about that.
your weary smile It proudly hides the chain marks on your hands We have bravely strived to realize the rights of everyone And all your bodies bent down low A victory of one But you sow the seeds of justice Thank you very much. Well, we have nearly come to the end of our concert and thank you all for watching and listening. Thanks to all my fellow performers who contributed so readily and so unselfishly to making this happen. You have all shown most eloquently that you are on the right side of history. Thanks also to Dan Neely for his always thoughtful and perceptive suggestions, and to the gifted journalist Earl Hitchner, who made me aware of the powerful writings of African-American poet Ross Gay. It was also Earl, writing in an Irish-American newspaper many years ago, who called all of us traditional musicians, singers and dancers an extended family. And we are indeed exactly that, and now very much a global family. As in all families, family members have a range of often differing opinions, but we are all united in our support of our black and brown brothers and sisters in their ongoing struggle for social justice and human rights and their battle with systemic racism. Here's my opinion. The first major step in this struggle for those of us who are American citizens is to go to the polls on November and vote out of office every public representative who does not believe in social justice, human rights, and freedom from oppression for all. This applies at every level, local, county, state, the Senate, Congress, and of course, president. Voting our deranged president out of office will not be enough. The accomplices who have enabled him over the past four years will have to go as well. I am optimistic enough to believe that Americans at this moment, with so many people of conscience of all ages and ethnicities united in purpose, has turned a pivotal corner and is ready for major change. I hope that our strength and unity as artists can, in however small a measure, help in making this change happen. I will now hand over to Lenny Sloan for his final comments and the brilliant and magnificent Seamus Egan to close out infinite hope. Vote, vote, vote. This is where I came in in the movie. I was a hippie peacenik turned rebel rouser. My family sent me to Selma and to Montgomery to march my first march as only a 13-year-old with Martin Luther King. I rioted after the Democratic Convention in, in 1968, and I revolted after Martin Luther King was shot, and I saw Philadelphia burn, and I picketed after the move when the police allowed Philadelphia to be burned down. And I believed in Martin Luther King's dream. I never dreamt that we would be going through this again. So I leave you with these words from the poet Maya Angelou from her poem, And Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod on me in the very dirt, but still like dust I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. 
just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springs high, still I rise. Did you want me to be broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awfully hard, cause I laugh like I got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air I rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come like a surprise that I dance like I got diamonds in the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame I rise. Up from the past that rooted in pain I rise. I am black ocean leaping and wide, wailing and swelling I bear in the tides, leaving behind nights of terror and fear. I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear I rise, bringing the gifts of my ancestors gave I rise. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise. I rise, rise up George Floyd to meet your mama, rise up world and protest his death, rise up pilgrims and soldiers of peace, rise, rise, rise. Hello, my name is Seamus Egan. I'm here in Vermont in the United States of America. Uh, it's an honour to be part of this gathering with my fellow Irish artists as we stand in solidarity with our black and brown and LGBTQ brothers and sisters. Uh, this is a time of introspection. Um, it's a time to examine our role in the system that has brought us to this place. Uh, it's a time to reflect on the privileges that we've accrued as a result of that system. Um, but it's also a time of action. Um, whatever we thought we knew, we know more now and we can never not know again. Um, the work will be difficult, the work will take time, but it's work that we must do to end this scourge of racism. I'm going to uh, play a slow air for you um, and I'd like to play it uh, in memory of all those who have lost their lives to police brutality and to racism. Uh, it's a tune called On Buhul Thanks for listening. 